This is the second lecture on multi-version current control. Uh, remember I said last class that the, the, the part one of the MCC lectures was to discuss the high-level ideas of the, of the protocol. And then today's lecture, now we want to get down into the weeds and talk about how, uh, how it's actually implemented in, in, in a real system. So uh, for today's lecture, I'm going to start off talking about with Hackathon, and then we'll talk about how Hyper does MVCC, and then we'll finish off with the CMU Cicada system. So I had this real big uh, debate with myself over the weekend and figure out how exactly I wanted to present this, right? Because I realized this is the paper I had you guys read, but in order to understand you know, why th this system does certain things, you kind of understand the, the, the things that came before it. So I decided to uh, have you guys read this anyway, because I think it's a really good paper, and it just came out uh, in 2017. Um, but I'll cover uh, these two other ones as well, and then you'll see why there's certain design decisions that they make in Cicada that uh, overcome some of the deficiencies, in particular with Hecaton, um, in, in their implementation. And then, as promised, for real, I'll go through and actually discuss Project 2 for real, okay? So... The first system I'm going to discuss is Hecaton, and I, talk, I mentioned Hecaton a little bit earlier, uh, I think in the second lecture or so, or the third lecture when we were talking about query compilation. Um, and so Hecaton is this influential system that came out of Microsoft uh, that was led by two really awesome database people, Paul Larson and Mike Zwilling. Paul Larson was at Microsoft Research. He's been involved in a lot of major database advancements the last 20, 30 years, like he been in linear hashing in the 1980s. And then Mike Zwilling, I mentioned, was the guy who was at uh, University of Wisconsin and, and helped write the Shore system that you guys read in the Looking Glass paper. And then he was later uh, hired by Microsoft to lead the team or be part of the team that was going to port Sybase uh, to Windows NT. So, Mike, so SQL Server was originally based on the Sybase code, and then Microsoft had they bought out the license, allow them to, to fork it and make a bunch of changes and actually sell it as a separate product. So the legacy of SQL Server is that it came from Sybase, but certainly now SQL Server has, has vastly surpassed the capabilities and performance of Sybase. Like Sybase is, and they, they had a new version came out last year, but it's SQL Server is, is I consider to be cutting edge. So in 2008, they started this new pr internal project, uh, the SQL project at, at Microsoft to build a new in-memory OLTP engine for Microsoft SQL Server. So the way to sort of think about this database engine is that in the same way with MySQL, you can replace InnoDB with RocksDB or other, other engines, or MongoDB, you, you can replace WireTiger with RocksDB. So they essentially wanted to do the same thing. They wanted to have the ability to plug and play different <laughs> database engines all within the, the same uh, uh, SQL Server system. And they had to do this because they had two key design constraints that they had to deal with uh, when they were building Hecaton and, how they, and this influenced how they designed their, their MVCC protocol. So the first is that they had to have their new engine integrate seamlessly with the rest of the SQL Server system, right? That means they couldn't make a brand new system and sell it as a separate product, right? And the reason is because there was this already this vast SQL Server ecosystem that, that people were using that you didn't want to replicate, right? Things were like administrative tools or like uh, crystal reports and, uh, and other uh, utilities that already existed for SQL Server. So if you put out a new system, you didn't want to have to replace all those things. So they had to make sure that Hecaton fit with, uh, sort of slide in seamlessly with, with, with SQL Server and, and use all the existing stuff. And then the second issue they had to deal with is that they need to make sure that uh, the new engine provided predictable performance for all OLTP workloads. So what I mean by that is uh, it could, they couldn't have a new engine where for 90% of the applications, you got much, much better performance. But then for some you know, unlucky 10%, you got worse performance than you would with regular, uh, than, than you would with regular SQL Server. And so you saw this behavior in the silo paper when I showed that one graph with the partition version of silo, which is essentially based on the h of of OLTB protocol, where if all your transactions are single partitioned, it got amazing performance. But then if you went beyond like 15%, then the performance actually would start to degrade. So because of that, they couldn't choose to do the, the same kind of protocol or conventional method that h or VoltDB was using because it would be really hard to sell a product where 90% of your customers are, are going to do awesome and an unlucky 10% were going to do worse, right? Like you couldn't sell a product where 90% of the people are going to be fine then 10% of the people get cancer, right? You can't sell that. So 
And especially in a database world too, where you would, you would, the customer wouldn't know whether they were the unlucky 10% until they actually bought the, you know, the, the new system. So because of that, they're going to forego the sort of optimal performance that you can get for if you have everything be single partition as you can get with HStore in exchange for uh, having more reliable, more predictable performance. So let's go through how they do MVCC. So uh, one difference we're going to see here than the previous protocols that we talked about before is that now transactions are not, only, not just going to have a single timestamp. So we saw this in the basic timestamp ordering protocol. The transaction was assigned a timestamp when it started. And we saw this with uh, OCC, where a transaction was assigned a timestamp after it got past the validation phase. Now in Hecaton, in their version of MVCC, you're, each transaction is going to get a timestamp when they begin, and then they'll assign, be assigned a a, a, another one later when they commit. And they're going to use these two timestamps to figure out the uh, uh, visibility of the various tuples. So just like how transactions have two timestamps, the tuples themselves also have two timestamps. So the begin timestamp will correspond to either the begin timestamp of the tr active transaction that, that is, 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 has created it, or the end timestamp of the, of the committed transaction that also created it, right? And then the end timestamp is the combination of either the begin timestamp, the actual transaction that, that created the next version, therefore invalidating this one, or infinity, meaning that transaction hasn't committed yet, or the end timestamp of the committed transaction. Right? So the tuples themselves, inside their timestamps, they're either going to be the begin timestamp of transactions or the end timestamps. And we'll still be able to figure out, based on these timestamps, whether a tuple is, is visible to us or not. So let's look at an example, and this, hope this will be more clear. So let's say we have a really simple table. Uh, it has two attributes. And we're going to have a begin and end timestamp in the tuple. And then because uh, Hecaton is doing uh, append-only storage, going from oldest to newest, we have to have a pointer that says, here's the next version, or, here's, the, you know, here's the next version in my version chain here. All right? So let's say we have a simple transaction that wants to do, do a read followed by a write. So it, it calls begin to start the transaction, and then it's assigned uh, a begin timestamp. And the way Hecaton is allocating timestamps, they're doing the shared counter that they'll just increment using uh, compare and swap. So now I want to do a read. I'm going to find a record where the attribute is equals John. So I'll do my lookup at my index. It'll follow down to the oldest version in my version chain for this attribute. In this case here, uh, I land I landed this tuple. And now I can do, do my comparison to see whether my transaction begin timestamp uh, falls in between the begin and end of this tuple. right? So uh, 25 is not in between 10 and 20, so we know we don't want this version. So we follow the version chain, land down here, and 25 is, is, is in between 20 and infinity, so we know that uh, we can read this. So now we want to do an update. So same thing, we land, uh, we go in our index, we do our lookup, we land down here. And so what we're going to do is we're going to replace the end timestamp of this tuple with a special timestamp for our transaction. So here I'm saying transaction 25. So the, what Hecaton is going to do, all the timestamps are, are going to reserve a single bit that allows it to specify whether it is a end timestamp of a transaction or for a transaction that's already committed or a timestamp for a begin timestamp for a transaction that's still running. So we take our begin timestamp, we flip a single bit uh, at the most significant slot, and that tells us that this timestamp corresponds to an active transaction. So we don't have to do a separate lookup to figure out whether it's actually it's true. You, do have, you may have to do a separate lookup to see whether this transaction is actually committed or not. But if that bit is not set, then you know the transaction is not active. So they're reducing the extra lookup you have to do to see whether this, this, this version was created by a transaction that was committed by setting that single bit. So now uh, I can go ahead and create my new version. right? Same thing. And begin timestamp, I'm going to put in my special uh, transaction uh, begin timestamp with that bit flip, flipped. And then I'm setting the, uh, the, the, the end timestamp to be infinity to say that this is the newest version, right? And then we update the version chain, and then we can go ahead and commit our transaction. And now I get, I get my end timestamp here. And then what I'm going to have to do is go back to every transaction, every version that I read or modified as part of creating a new version. So the, the old version and the new version. And now I need to go flip their... Uh, 
the placeholder transaction ID that I had in, in, the, in these timestamps here, flip them to my commit timestamp. And at this point, then the transaction is considered to be fully committed. Well, actually, let's take it back. After we got past the validation phase, then we get our end timestamp, and then we go back and now update these timestamps to say that this is the final timestamp of, of this transaction. So is this clear? Right? So this looks a lot different than what we saw uh, when we talked about basic timestamp ordering or MVCC before, because now my transaction has two timestamps, and I'm setting this little bit to say that this is an active transaction. Right? I was sort of hand wavy before when I showed the example of how basic MVCC OC, or timestamp ordering MVCC worked, and I mentioned that oh well you you, you know you hold these these latches for these tuples, or hold the, hold these write locks, um, but you still may be able to read them. Then you have to go check to see whether uh, the transaction is actually committed or not. So this is what I'm talking about here by I, by using this little bit to, to mark that this is from an active transaction. I know I have to go check to some other additional data structure to figure out whether this, this transaction has committed or not. But once I get here, now that bit is flipped to zero, so I know the transaction is committed and I don't have to do that extra check. Yes? So like before commit transaction 35, if here comes like three jobs, like what will be available is like the first record, right? So this question is, what happens if another transaction comes along and tries to read this? Yeah, before it commits itself. Right, good, excellent. So uh, that's my next example. I'm going to rewind. Right, I didn't know how else to show this, right? But I'm going to rewind and I'll go back to exactly as you said here. Right, so transaction hasn't committed yet. And now we have another transaction that comes in and wants, and wants to do a read and a write. So this transaction starts. It gets it, its begin timestamp as 30. And it wants to do a read on John. So the same thing. We hop in our index. We check here. We're, we're, not, we're not in the range. We check here. We're also not in the range. So this, again, we, we know that this timestamp can be treated as 25, right? Just as a regular timestamp would. We just had this little bit to say, oh, it's, but it's also from an active transaction. So here, we, we can't read in this version. So then we land down here. So in, uh, in Hecaton, they're going to allow speculative reads. So I'm gonna, this transaction is going to be allowed to read this, this version created by this transaction even though this transaction has not committed yet. And then later on, when we talk about validation, it has to go through and say, well, what data did I read? Uh, and did those transactions actually commit? Right? Because otherwise, you would violate serializable order because you'd be reading things. You'd be having, essentially, you'd be doing dirty reads. Right? So there's a big difference between the regular uh, timestamp ordering MVCC that we talked about last class. Uh, we're allowing transactions to do speculative reads. But that we pay a cost in terms of additional metadata to keep track of uh, what we actually read. All right, so now let's say this transaction wants to do a write, right? And wants to update that same record, John. So it, it, would, be, it would be happy to try to create a new version here, but it's not going to be able to because, because this transaction bit is essentially be going to be treated as a, as a write lock on this physical version. And in Hecaton, the first writer wins. So this transaction will be immediately aborted. So it would come along the version chain, find this, see the begin timestamp has that bit flipped, meaning I know that this was created by a transaction that has not committed yet, and therefore I can't create a new version. My transaction, this, this second transaction here, immediately gets aborted and rolled back. So in Hackathon, they're going to allow for speculative reads, uh, but not for speculative writes. The first writer always wins. Anything that comes after it tries to write, write, a, new, write a new version for the same logical tuple will always get aborted. Oh, is this clear? OK. So we talked about this before uh, at a high level, but now we can go to the more detail of what this global map is we need to maintain to keep track of what, what, what's going on with all the actual transactions. So essentially, there's a, there's a global hash map inside the database system that keeps track of every single transaction and, and, their, and their state. So things are sort of obvious. Like when you, if your state is active, it means that you're still in the process of reading and writing. You haven't tried to commit yet. If you're in the validating state, it means the, the application has told the database server, I want to commit this transaction, start the validation process, and you go through the, the normal OCC checking uh, that we talked about before. right? And then if you get past this, now your state gets flipped to committed. So the transaction has finished. We've, I'm, I'm not talking about logging here, but presumably we've already logged its changes out the disk, so we know everything's durable. Uh, 
We can tell the application at this point that our transaction is committed. So we can release, assuming we didn't read data from, from actually, you would not get past validating if you read speculative reads because you can't, you have to check to say, you have to wait until you see whether the transactions you read data from has actually committed. So at this point here, you can release everything back to the application. Um, but you may have not gone back and updated all those timestamps that we set in our different versions to remove that bit to say that our transaction was active. So this is why I was saying before, when, when you're at here, uh, if, you're, if you're reading this, um, the transaction may have actually committed. You can check the, uh, the, the, that global hash map and say, well, is this transaction actually active or is it actually, is it actually finished? Um, so you, could, you would check this. And then that way, if you know that it's actually committed, then you know you can go ahead and proceed with reading anything it wrote without having to check later on when, when, you, when you go to validate. And at the very end, when you, you get determinated, this basically just says that there's no other transaction that could be reading, uh, uh, that we have to care about, could be reading any data. Uh, there's no other transaction that is waiting for us to commit. And then we've successfully all updated all our different versions. Right? And then there's a garbage collection process you can go through and start, and start cleaning things up. Right? Yes? Uh, what's the correct order that another thread is um, validating for? Uh, when uh, trying to validate when, when they are uh, accessed to so Your question is what's the correct order? Yeah, so you mentioned basic two stuff. One is the conversion in the tuple. One is the global hash map that stores the state of the transactions. Yes. Uh, when, when, one, when one thread has have updated the tuple, and, and then another thread is coming and trying to update that tuple, is it going to check the version number of tuple, or is it going to check a global hash map? Oh, so in this case here? Yes. All right, so I would come here. I would see that the begin timestamp for this version. So this transaction essentially wants to create another version here. He would, he would come along and see that this transaction has a begin timestamp. It is, uh, it's the, act, the active bit is set to true. Then you go do a lookup and see whether, uh, you could do a lookup and see whether it actually has committed or not. If not, then you just kill yourself immediately, right? First writer always wins. Okay. So what, what are some other metadata? So what, the meta, what is the metadata we need, we need to have on a per transaction basis to figure out whether it's actually safe to commit and, or validate our transaction? So this is, this is going to be important later on when we start discussing hyper, because hyper is not going to have to maintain all this extra stuff that Hecaton does. And, and hyper is going to choose to, to, to uh, record less information because it wants to be optimized for OLAP queries. Um, whereas in Hecaton, they're trying to optimize for OLTP queries. So Hyper is still going to support OLTP workloads, but for OLAP queries, some of these things, as we'll see later on, becomes uh, expensive. So they're going to have the read and write set for every transaction. Uh, so the read set is basically for every single tuple that I read, uh, like think of the physical version that's visible to me. So I don't care whether if I go along the chain, I read a bunch of versions that are not visible to me. It's the one I land on that actually would be exposed to the application. I need to record a pointer to all those different versions, uh, or just all to that version in my, in my read set. The write set, you need to maintain pointers to, uh, to different versions based on what you did. So if you updated an existing version, you need to have the old and new, right? Because you're flipping those timestamps to keep track of uh, what's visible. So you need to know how, how to go find them again. Uh, if you delete, you just need to keep to the old version, and they put a little tombstone at the end of the version chain and say this thing has been deleted. And if you insert a new one, obviously, it's, you just point to your own version there. But two additional things we're going to have to maintain are the scan set and the commit dependencies. So commit dependencies are sort of obvious, right? It's the, the list of all the transactions that we know are waiting for us to commit. So if one transaction does a speculative read on data that, that we wrote, then they will add themselves to our commit dependency list. And then when we commit, then we just go through the list and notify them sort of like in, in a pub sub manner to say, hey, I've committed. Do whatever it is you need to do. The scan set, though, is a bit tricky. Um, the scan set is going to be all the information we need in order to re-execute any scans uh, th that happened while a uh, transaction ran, or any query that the transaction executed. And this is different than the read set, because the read set is like, here's the individual tu versions that I read, or individual tuples that I read. The scan set is like the where clause of a query that was executed. Um, and we need this because we need to go back and re-execute those scans to figure out whether anybody inserted or deleted something in the range of the things that we scanned. 
So I'm not going to really get into the storage architecture too much of how Hecaton works, but essentially the tables are organized as hash tables. So the buckets in your hash table contain all the tuples, right? So in Hecaton, they don't actually support just scanning the raw tables. So you have to always walk through the, uh, the hash table. And so therefore you need to know what all the range queries you did on that hash table in order to figure out later on whether there was any phantoms. So this is essentially the same thing we saw in Silo, right? Silo had to maintain the scan sets. And then we want to validate our transaction. We have to do that again. So that's essentially sort of what I said here. So in order to do transaction validation, there's two steps we're going to need to do, right? In addition to the, uh, you know, uh, well, there's no write-write conflicts because if I try to write to the same tuple uh, as somebody else, I get a border. So we don't have to worry about that. So it's really the read-write conflicts we have to deal with. So the first check we have to do is, is called read stability. And it's basically as we go back and see whether we, any version of a tuple we read is still considered visible uh, by the end of our, our, of our transaction. So we have to do this because we have speculative reads. So we may end up reading a version and that, that version may end up getting rolled back because the transaction that created it would, would get aborted later on. So we have to go back and do additional check, additional read to see whether we, we, that version is still visible to us. And then to avoid phantoms, we essentially have to rescan or re-execute all the scans we, we ran before, again, to see whether, uh, whether the result set changes from, uh, from, from, you know, from, from one, one time, the first time we ran it versus the second time we ran it. Right? So you may think this kind of sucks, right? Because this could be really expensive. The way to sort of think about this is like, if you have a complex query that computes some kind of, you know, aggregation or invokes a UDF that computes the 20th digit of pi or whatever, uh, I guess the millionth digit of pi. Um, you don't really have to re-execute all that. Whatever's in the projection list or select list, you don't re-execute. It's really just the where clause I have to reapply. But then I go back to the actual court and the, the raw data itself, the actual hash table for the table, and re-execute the scan to see whether I get a different result. So that part isn't so bad. Uh, but if you, ha if you scan the entire table, this is obviously be a really bad thing to do. So Hecaton is not designed for doing analytic queries, right? OLAP queries. It's, pure, it's a pure OLTP engine. So now the amount of validation you have to do for these two additional steps depends on what isolation level you're running at. For a serializable isolation level, you have to do both. For repeatable read, you just need to do read stability checks. Um, for snapshot isolation and recommitted, uh, you essentially don't have to do any of these because uh, the snapshot isolation by itself guarantees these things, right? In the case of readstability, right, I, I can't read anything that, um, I couldn't have read anything from a transaction that was active when I started, so I'm guaranteed to have a consistent snapshot of the database. So I, I don't have to check to see whether the version I read was still visible when I go to validate, because if it wasn't visible, I wouldn't have read it in the first place, right? So that's sort of uh, obvious. And for recommitted, essentially, it, it's the same thing. All right, so I'm going to show one graph performance measurement they have from their paper. Uh, and for this, what they're, they're, they're comparing their uh, multi-versioned optimistic concurrent control protocol. So if you, if you say, oh, we use the Hecaton protocol, you essentially mean this. The paper, as, 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 as it's written, sort of goes on describing this protocol to start with. And then they, they have another section that comes after this and says, oh, by the way, here's how to do basically the same thing, but with, with in, in a pessimistic manner. So the optimistic uh, protocol is the multi-version OCC that's doing all the things that we talked about before with the, um, with the phantom checks and the restability checks. And then their pessimistic version is essentially strict two-phase locking. Uh, we'll use shared and exclusive locks on the records as well as the hash table buckets. So this is one way they're gonna avoid phantoms is that uh, all the versions or all the, 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 the data sort of logic ordered in these, these blocks and I know how to lock a block to prevent somebody else from inserting an entry that I scanned. Right, because you know where the, the insert would go. So you don't need additional validation. And they're going to be doing uh, deadlock, deadlock detection based two phase locking. So we need a separate thread in the background to periodically go look at the weights for graph and decide whether two threads are deadlocked in each other and then break them up. So this is the one graph I want to show you here. Uh, so this is a really small table with only 1,000 tuples. Um, and they're doing 80% uh, read only uh, transactions and 20% update transactions. And they're scaling across the uh, x-axis the number of threads that they're going to use to allocate transactions or execute transactions. So up to around six threads, the two are essentially the same. But then beyond that, we see that 
the optimistic version of Hecaton uh, performs the best. Right? So you may think over here, like the gap of 24 threads isn't, isn't that much, but you got to look at the, the, the y-axis scale. So they're executing 1.5 million transactions per second uh, with, with the optimistic version. And then for the pessimistic version with two-phase locking, they're executing, uh, like, I think, just a little bit over like, uh, 1.1 million. So the difference between this line and this line at this part over here is like 330,000 million or 330, transactions a second. That's a lot. So we've run similar experiments, maybe not on the exact same hardware, but with Postgres and MySQL, and they can maybe do 30,000, 40,000 transactions a second. So the gap between these two is, is you know, 10x of what, what, what uh, Oracle, and, or so MySQL and Postgres can do. So this is a lot. To, to pump a million, a million and a half transactions per second on a single box is, is, is really, really fast. Um, I think they're not actually running through the full SQL Server uh, uh, stack when they show these numbers. I also don't think they're actually doing logging in this. So this is sort of pure in-memory performance. Um, but it's quite significant. Right? And uh, I mean, I, if we have time, I can show you numbers at the end. But they, they sh in, the, in a lot of the talks about Hecaton that came out around, around the same time the paper was released, they show some examples from, from real-world workloads where they're getting about 5x performance improvement over uh, what regular SQL Server can do. And they also show how like the latency is cut down significantly, right? Of course, because everything's in memory, you can write to things really fast. So the main lessons that you can get from the Hecaton work is that the, the, sort of the main two takeaways that they have are they argue that when you design your, your, your transaction process and database system, your, your in-memory database system, you should strive to only use lock-free data structures. So that means that for, for your, for your, you don't want any latches, spin locks, critical sections, mutexes, anything. For your indexes, your transaction uh, state map, your memory allocator, and your garbage collector internal state. So I actually disagree with this, and we'll see this next week. Uh, it turns out uh, using lock-free indexes or latch-free indexes isn't as great as they claim. So in particular, in Hecaton, one of the big contributions of the system as well is this thing called the BW tree. Uh, I think that's the assigned reading from Monday next week. Uh, we, this is the index we use in, in, in Peloton. And as we'll see in, the, in our experiments we've done here at CMU, it gets crushed by uh, non lock for your latch free indexes. And then the skip list is what you guys are implementing as well. And that's even worse. Right? So, we'll, we'll, so we'll try to understand next week why. Okay. Then they also argue that the, uh, you want to minimize the number of serialization or coordination points you have in your data management system, right? And the only place you have to coordinate your transactions uh, explicitly is through the, uh, the timestamp counter. So they have a shared counter that's used the, uh, by all the threads, that's used for the begin and the end timestamp. They're, they're all in the same time scale. And they, you just do a compare and swap to, to increment them. Now, we saw in the silo paper, they actually argue that's a bad idea. Because if you have a lot of cores, every single time you call compare and swap and increment that counter, any core thread that read that counter would now get a cache and validation message, right? And, and if you're executing a lot of transactions per second, that's gonna that's gonna be a lot of traffic on, on your chip. So in the silo case, they would avoid this or they try to minimize this by doing the batching. Um, but in Hecaton, they, they don't do that. So any questions about Hecaton? In the back, yes. How are they communicating the commit? This question is, how are you communicating de commit dependencies between the threads? So if I read something from, I do a speculative read, and I, and I read something from a transaction that, that hasn't committed yet, uh, I know what that transaction is because I would see that, that transaction ID in the begin timestamp. So then I would say, all right, I read this, and then I do my lookup in the map table, get a pointer to its commit dependency list for that transaction I read from, I add myself, and then when that transaction commits, then they notify you, say, hey, I, I go ahead and commit it. So do, what, you know, do whatever you need to do to clean up. Uh, when you do speculative uh, reading, so what is the other transaction uh, about after you after you validate that the read is the same? So, so his question is, if I do a speculative read and I read data from a transaction uh, that hasn't committed yet, but then that transaction aborts, what happens to me? Yeah, I, you, I, you, so you wouldn't you wouldn't get past the validation, right? You can't go past you can't validate until you know where the transaction is, is actually committed, okay. right? So you can't commit until the other guy commits. But you just said that, like, uh, in the validation phase, you just check whether the tuple is the same or not, like, 
Yeah, so, so I, I should have added, like, you also have to check the, whether the thing you read is, is whether the transaction has committed yet, right? And so, I mean, that is sort of the same thing, right? So you go back and read the same version again, right? And you would check to see whether the, the, the begin timestamp has flipped to now say that, you know, the transaction was committed, right? And then you just, you, um, I think they, I think they spin and wait to see whether the other transaction is committed. Back, yes. Uh, speculated reads seem to lead to a higher abort rate, right? So the statement is, uh, speculative reads seems to lead to a higher abort rate. I, again, it's a cop out, but it depends, right? Like, uh, it depends on the workload, right? If everybody's trying to update the same record, and you read that record, then it's likely that the re the you know the thing you read is going to get ab aborted. So yes, but there's certainly cases where there, if there's low contention, then that's a that's a good trade off. I mean, like not having speculative reads would surely lead to lesser abortions. So why not just? Allow just reading one version before instead of allowing speculative reads. So his statement is, uh, or, or yeah, your statement is, instead of allowing a transaction to read, uh, the read the latest version. So let's go to this example here, sample here. So you're saying, so for this guy, instead of allowing him to, to read this speculatively, it's better to read this. Yeah. You can't, right? Because my begin timestamp is 30. I need to read the version that came after 25, because this is not visible to me. Yeah, but since it's actively being used by another transaction, so just for this, for these cases, allow it to read one version before. Like, so this transaction here is going to read this version here. Yeah. That's not serializable, right? Because now I'm reading. I need to be. I need to read this because this is the version that would appear if I executed this in serial order, this followed by this. I, I can't read that. Uh, I can't read this because I should have read this. And that, again, violates serializable order. So it's crashing? Is it in like isolation level? So your statement is, does it depend on the isolation level? Yes. If you, if you, uh, if you, if you, if you run read uncommitted, you read that, you don't care if it aborts or not. Who cares, right? Uh, if you run at, uh, I guess next one level up is read committed. Um, yeah, you would you would read this because this is this is considered committed, right? And then if you read it again, you would re if you try to read this again, and this was actually committed, you may end up read this, which is not repeatable, but that's okay under read committed. Do they have writing pencil or graph? Uh, his, qu his question is, do they have a write uh, a work? We'll get to that. Cicada has that, yes. We'll see this at the end. Okay, any other questions? I like the Hecats on paper because like it's um, it's well written and I think it explains the sort of the, the, the trade-offs and design decisions for implementing a protocol like this in, in a real clear way. At least at least I can understand it. Okay. So let's, let's make some observations about uh, how Hecaton works. So the first is that uh, the, the read and scan set validation process we have to do is expensive if we have transactions that access a lot of data. So in their example, uh, you know, when I showed the graph, you know, transactions are updating, you know, read and writing maybe a, a small number of tuples, like less than 10. Uh, and if you if you're executing the YCSV workload, most of the transactions only read or write a single tuple, right? So maintaining the, the read set for that is cheap because it's a single single pointer to a tuple, right? And the scan set essentially is cheap as well because it's a point query into the index to find the one thing that I want. But if I'm trying to execute an analytical query that may be scanning a large segment of the table, then Recording every single tuple that I that I look at in my read set is going to get expensive. If I if I have a transaction that reads a billion tuples, I have to put a billion pointers in my read set. Now we said before that you can maybe declare your transaction as read only, and therefore you just disable all of this read set scan set validation. Um, I don't know how common that is in real applications, right? We don't have we don't have customers. We don't know what real numbers look like. But certainly storing every single pointer, that, that's expensive. The next issue you got to deal with is that, uh, again, if I'm doing large scans, uh, 
then I'm always going to have to maybe chase these pointers to go down my versions to find the version I should be actually reading. Right? And that sort of now that means you have if clauses, you have to you, you know jump to different locations in memory. Right? That's going to hurt your cache locality, that's going to hurt hurt your instructions per cycle. And the last one is that it may be also the case that doing record level uh, conflict checks, like did I write to the same thing that you wrote to, may actually be too coarse grain for trans some transactions. Uh, it may end up leading to false positive aborts or fa you know, false aborts, where I think there's a conflict when there actually isn't one. So, based on these observations, the hyper guys came up with their own version of MVCC, um, and they're going to be uh, hyper is designed for HTAP workloads. So that means they want to support fast transactions and fast analytics, all in the context of the same database. So the design decisions that the Hecaton guys made, like maintaining the pointers for every single version I read, uh, is going to be insufficient because if, if you're scanning a lot of data, you're going to have to record a lot of pointers. So they're going to be doing a delta record versioning with uh, version chains going from newest to oldest. And they're going to try to do in-place updates for any attributes that are, aren't indexed. Uh, if I update an attribute that is indexed, then I'll just do a delete and insert, like we talked about last class when we handle primary keys. Right? And essentially just creates a new version chain. Um, but the key is that they're, they're not going to do the scan checks or the, the block locks, the bucket locks, the way Hecaton does, and, uh, when they actually want to enforce uh, serializability. Right? And we'll see what they're going to do in a second, but they essentially have a, a more efficient way of, of checking these things without having to re-execute every single scan over and over again. And just like in Hecaton, they're going to avoid the write-write conflicts by aborting any transaction that tries to update the same, the same tuple. So here's a high-level uh, overview of what the architecture looks like. So as I said, it's a column store. So every single attribute is stored continuously in a, in a block of memory. And then they're going to have a separate column called the version vector that is going to have pointers to the, oldest ver or the, the older versions of, of, the, of, of a particular logical tuple. But one difference from sort of the high-level example we talked about before that Hecaton's going to, or sorry, the Hyper is going to do is that the rollback segments or the undo buffers for every uh, for ev the the ro delta records that we organize on a per transaction basis. So rather than just having a global space where we put all our old records or the, the, the deltas. Every transaction is going to have its local memory pool, and then as it creates new versions, it's going to copy the old version or the delta of it into its local memory. And we do this for performance reasons because now we don't have a global uh, memory space in the heap where every transaction needs to you know, try to do a compare and swap or do a acquire a lock on in order to insert a new delta record. This thread knows that nobody else can be, or this transaction knows that nobody else can be writing to the same memory, uh, so that it can just, you know append new entries uh, without worrying about, without coordinating with anybody else. So the key thing about this is that the reason why they want to do this, this have this architecture, is that when you want to now do analytical uh, queries, uh, most of the time you're going to be able to just rip right through your column store and not follow the, the old versions. So there are many cases, we'll see this when we talk about synopsis, uh, the vector synopsis, or the version synopsis, there may be cases where you do have to follow the version to make sure you read the right thing, but if you're storing your entire database in this system, only a small portion of it is actually going to be modified, right? Only a small portion is going to be considered hot, where you're going to be getting updates. All your cold data, things from you know days, weeks, months ago, they're not going to have versions, so you can just rip through your columns very efficiently and not have to chase pointers. Right? So that's sort of why they, they go with this architecture here. So the dirty secret about Hyper is that the paper claims to be multi-threaded, uh, to the best of my knowledge from discussing with their, uh, with their, uh, their developers. Um, it is actually single thread. Um, but for our purposes, it doesn't matter. Um, and I, I don't know what's actually in the commercial version in Tableau, but the academic version, as far as I know, was, was single threaded. So meaning they can do single threaded transactions, and multi-threaded analytical queries. And that was it was so fast that that was good enough for, for what, they, what they were targeting. All right, so let's see how they do validation. So again, like in Hecaton, they're going to do first writer wins. Um, 
And so that means, again, we don't have to check to see whether the right sets between two transactions overlap. Um, and then the version vector is always going to end up pointing to the, the latest uh, committed version. Because if, uh, if I go try to update, uh, create a new version, and I know that the, the, the master version in the main, main data table is actually from a pending transaction, then I know I'm trying to write something that somebody else already wrote to and hasn't committed yet, so I can immediately abort myself. So uh, there's essentially only one uncommitted version of a, of, a, of, a, of a tuple that exists in the system. But now, the way they're going to check for read-write conflicts is actually kind of cool and much different than, than any other system. So what they're going to do is they're going to check the delta records generated. Uh, so if, if I'm a transaction that's validating, I'm going to check the delta records that were created by all other transactions that had committed after I started and to see whether my, uh, any of my queries overlap with uh, the, the, the data that they created. So they're going to use a technique called precision locking. And so what's really cool about this is that uh, this paper is from like 1980s, from before when I was born, and no one actually has ever used this. Uh, the paper has like 55 citations, which is ridiculous for you know, a 35-year-old paper. So this, this paper essentially was forgotten. The hyper guy, some guy somehow pulled it out and like, oh, this is actually what we want to use. Uh, and so this is, what, this is what they're using. So the pre precision locking is sort of a variation of predicate locking. But instead of actually checking to see whether predicates over overlap, you just need to check whether the right set overlaps with your predicates. All right? So uh, I'll go through an example of this. So now this means that we don't need to record all of the uh, individual pointers to the tuples that we read, and we don't need to record the scan set like we did in Hecaton. We just need to record our, our, our predicates um, and just compare them with the right set of, of the other transactions. So let's look at an example here. So say this is the transaction that I want to commit, right? And we executed three analytical queries. And then over here now, we have the, uh, the delta storage, the delta records that were created by transactions that were committed after this transaction uh, had, had started. So say this transaction started at uh, timestamp um, you know, oh, 10, 10 04, and then all these other transactions then, then committed after that. So now I need to go check to see whether the, the, the where clause of, of these different tuples, of these different queries overlap with the right set. So I don't, I don't have to check any transaction that committed before I started because under snapshot isolation, I would have been able to read them, right? So it's only ones that committed afterwards. So in this case here, we just look at the where clause. This says attribute two greater than 20 and attribute two less than 30. So I look in the Delta records for uh, this transaction I see that they modified attribute two, so I pluck out those two different values and I substitute them for my where clause, and then I evaluate my predicate, and it's false, so therefore I know I don't have an overlap here. Right? Same thing for the next one. I sub substitute attribute two in here between the two different values that were generated. I evaluate my, my where clause, and it e equals to false, so I know I don't have an overlap. And then same thing for the last one down here. It's false. All right? So I just keep going down the line, and I'll do this for every single predicate and every single uh, uh, record in my delta storage. And then I get to this last one here, and I see where ice cube is like the wildcard ice. So therefore, I, I have an overlap here because this evaluates to true. And therefore, I know that I have a phantom here, and I have to abort this transaction. Right? So what's going on here, when I ran this query the first time, I didn't see this record because this transaction didn't commit yet. But then I, now I'm validating. I run this scan check again, and now I see ice cube, which I didn't see that before. So now I, I, I know I have a phantom and I'd have to report. And so they do a bunch of things like they they order the um, they order the uh, the the delta records they evaluate and the order that, that they were uh, most uh, le recently committed, or sorry, old, the oldest committed ones. Um, there's other tricks they can do to sort of speed things up. And the way underneath the covers they're going to represent these precision locks is essentially a, a tree data structure. So they'll convert these where clauses into a tree, and then you can apply these, these, these values at runtime very efficiently. Yes? So these the three transactions we were checking against, they all should have timestamps before the one that we're validating? His, his question is, the, the transactions we're, we're comparing against, they have a commit timestamp that occurs before our, our guy. So these, again, these transactions have already committed and validated. Sorry, they validated and committed. They're done. 
right? We still maintain their undo buffers because we know that there may be a transaction that uh, that started before these guys committed, and therefore they might overlap. So we have to check to check them, right? But once these guys, once this say this transaction finishes, the system would know there's no other transaction that uh, started before these guys actually started before these guys committed. So therefore, I don't need to maintain their undo buffers, but their their version would already be installed in the system. Right, so again, this avoids having to do the scan set checks that Hecaton and Silo did. Right? All right, so the other cool thing that, that Hyper does, that I think is pretty clever, is that they have what are called virgin synopsis. And the basic idea here is that they're going to have a separate column that they store that's going to keep track of the positions or offsets in the columns of where the first version tuple starts and the, and the last version tuple stops. Right? So the way to think about this, again, every position is an offset. These, these, these columns are fixed length, so I know how to easily compute uh, my offset when I want to jump to a particular, particular position. And then in my version synopsis for this block, um, so they organize things in blocks of 1024 tuples. They call, they're actually called morsels. We'll see that later on in another paper. But in my synopsis, it says that the first version tuple starts at uh, uh, position offset 2, and then the last one ends at position 5. So right here's 2, and then here's 4. So I know that anything in, in these segments here, I know they don't have older versions. So when I code gen the, the, you know, the, the scan on this table, I know that up to a certain point, I don't need to check this version vector at all. Right? I, I don't have to do any branching. I don't, I don't have to go down the version chain and figure out anything else. I can just rip, again, rip through this data and process it very efficiently. And then when I get within the range defined by my version synopsis, then I know I have to have the, the, the code gen scan actually do a bunch of extra checks. Right? This is another example of, of an optimization that they do in Hyper in order to speed up analytical queries, but still support uh, the multi-versioning and transactions. Okay, any questions about Hyper? Hyper is the system we're going to see all throughout the, uh, the semester. Yes? For the precision locking, you mentioned that they use uh, sort of like a tree for the predicates. Yes. For the reason they don't compile those like, predicate evaluations. Oh, so, so his, his, his question is, um, I'm saying they're using a tree data structure for the, uh, to, to represent the precision locks. Is there any reason why they just didn't actually compile, don't actually compile? They probably do compile it. Everything, everything in in, uh, in 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 hyper is compiled. Um, I mean, in the paper, they they it's just they talk about it in terms of trees, right? But you can easily compile that down, and they probably do, right? Okay, so now we can talk about Cicada. So Cicada is a OSB engine uh, in the same vein as Hecaton, um, but it's a, it's a modern variant of it. So they're going to be doing optimistic multi-versioning um, with uh, newest to oldest append-only storage. And the high-level idea is essentially the same thing we saw in Hecaton and what we saw in, in last class when um, we're talking about uh, multi-versioning. But they have a bunch of um, some optimizations that I think are, are, are interesting that I want to sort of focus on. So one of the key design decisions that, that, they're, that, that they chose is that they want the system to be able to work well for both low contention and high contention workloads. So this, they talk about how in a single versioning system, uh, if you have low contention, a single versioning system works much, be much better, it's more efficient than a multi-versioning system because you don't, you're not going to have transactions that need to go back and read older versions, right? Most transactions can just read the latest version and that's good enough. Um, so they're trying to be able to balance both. They work in both cases, the, 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 the low contention and high contention, and there's a bunch of optimizations they do to be able to handle that. So I'm going to focus on... Uh, on the inlining, the validation, and the index nodes, because um, these things are actually really interesting. The the synchronized clock stuff, um, it is is one way to do it. Uh, TikTok is another way to do this. Silo is another way. Um, the only thing I say is that they, it's very clever what they do, and they're basically applying techniques from distributed data from distributed systems, but making it work on a single node system, which I think I think is very very cool. Um, in the sake of time, I, 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 I'm not going to have time to actually go through the details of it. Uh, but essentially what they're doing is they're, they're allowing clocks to drift, and then they have a way to boost it 
uh, every so often to, to, to make sure that they're actually in sync with low coordination. All right, so Cicada is a, a pen-only system. But as we saw in, in the case of Hyper, Hyper makes the argument that having to traverse the version chain uh, can be really expensive. And so what, what they decide to do instead is that uh, in, they're going to have a, a single data structure to keep track of the, essentially the, the head of the version chain. So it's like a pointer list to say, you know, that is, that is immutable for a, single, for a single logical tuple. It always says, if you jump to this offset, here's how to, I'll have a pointer to get you to the, the, the next version, in the, the first version in my chain. And so what they're going to do is they're going to actually try to pack in the latest version uh, of a tuple in this, this sort of centralized data structure here, right? So this essentially ends up being like a delta storage system um, but it allows them to decide dynamically on the fly whether to, to, to inline the, the, the latest version here or not. So in this case here, say I have uh, three tuples, and so the first guy for the pointer, it points off now to, to the version chain, right, which is again some other tuple in our, in our, in our table storage. Um, but for the second two guys, the pointer ends up pointing to a version that's embedded in this, uh, this, this data structure here. Right, and the paper talks about how uh, if, it's, if it's the right size and it's read mostly, then you want to pack it in here. So this is, again, essentially allowing them to be flexible like an append-only storage, but still get the benefits of uh, a delta, store, delta, only, delta storage model or, or versioning by having the master tuple or the latest version of the tuple be in a centralized data structure. So they're not supporting analytical queries, but it would make it easier to scan this, scan this through and to find exactly what you're looking for rather than having to follow the chain, right? Because that indirection layer, having to jump through from one version to the next, again, that hurts your cache, cache locality and that is, becomes expensive. So they try to reduce that by inline. So the next thing they have is uh, a ways to do fast validation. So the one interesting thing that they do is that they try to keep track of the amount of contention in the system and avoid having to do a, a bunch of additional checks that you normally have to do uh, in, in sort of the regular protocol. So the idea here is you relax some of the validation steps you do. Uh, you're not still, you're not violating your serializable guarantees. You're just, you're being less paranoid about the checks. So the first is that uh, they will try to, or, they will order the tuples and the right set you need to validate against in the order that they were recently modified. So in, uh, in TikTok and Silo, they sorted them based on the primary key to ensure that uh, there was no coordination and, and, that, and no deadlocks so that all the threads that are, at, that are validating at the same time validate their tuples in the same order. So instead, what they're going to do, instead of doing but based on that, they're going to actually do it in the order that they were modified. And the idea here is that if there's a highly contended uh, tuple that everybody's always trying to, uh, to modify, you want to check that first to see whether there is a conflict because you want to abort your transaction as early as possible, right? Because otherwise, if it's the last tuple you check, then you do a bunch of validations and checking uh, that's wasted, wasted instructions only to find out later on that your transaction is going to abort and then you just wasted a bunch of work. Likewise, for the, um, they try to do pre-validation to make sure that uh, before they actually do any global writes, and then this is essentially again doing this, this 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 consistency check. So this idea is actually derived from the TikTok paper, which we didn't cover. But again, the the idea here is that since the global writes into the shared database is expensive, you try to kill yourself as soon as possible before you do wasted work. And then the last one is that they do an incremental version search, where they basically keep track of in your version chain if you read the same tuple. Uh, What's the version I actually want? So that way, when you try to read that same thing again, you know how to jump exactly to that position rather than checking every single version. All right. So the main idea here is that by being contention aware is that if you know that a, a most, uh, your most recent transactions have uh, committed successfully without having to abort and roll back, then you can, you can skip these steps. And it still doesn't violate the, uh, your serializable guarantee because you still have to do the validation at the end. Right. So now the other really cool thing about Cicada, 
that as far as I know, I don't think anybody actually does this. Um, and when I read this, I was like, it's sort of tucked in the paper, and I was like, oh shit, this is actually really cool. Like, I, you feel like they should have they should have uh, promoted this more than like the, the loosely synchronized clocks, right? To me, this 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 is really novel, um, and I don't actually know whether it's a good idea in in, in, in a general system, um, but it's certainly something we, we should think about. So, we'll see this on Wednesday, but there's this big. Uh, tension in a database management system or in a transactional database management system between the concurrent show protocol that we have for the tuples and the tables and the concurrent show protocol that we have in our indexes right and and the issue is that the with indexes we don't want to be holding locks or latches for the duration of the transaction because that's going to prevent other transactions from accessing the index and we don't actually care about the physical uh, layout of of an index, so we don't care if the underlying data structure gets modified every single time we keep re read it in the same transaction. We only care whether, whether the logical contents have changed. So, meaning the if I have a B plus tree, I can reorganize the nodes, you know, during my transaction, right? As long as I if I look up a key and I get back the same result, as long as the after reorganization it always produces you know the same result. That's all I care about. So we'll see this next class. But there's all this extra stuff people do. Um, with, with, you know, crabbing and then the, the, the gap locks and things like that in order to hand, handle phantoms in a data structure where the underlying physical storage could change. So in Cicada, they throw that all, all that extra crap out and they just say, well, f to store the index inside the table itself and which we'll treat it as a regular tuple. So we're already doing concurrent control for, for, for the data table tu tuples. Now we do concurrent control for the index nodes, right? So the way to sort of think about this is like the, the node itself is an actual tuple. And because it's multi-version, a multi-version database, now we can have multiple versions for our index nodes. So in Cicada, all they're storing is, is a blob, right? Some block of memory that has the, the, you know, the key array and the value array and then the low and high keys that you know the store, you know, in a, in a regular B plus tree. Um, but you could actually store these things as separate fields. So now you can do other sophisticated things like, well, I updated the keys, but I don't implicate the values, and I don't need to do validation on that, right? So this is really fascinating because essentially, again, you get the serialization protocol that you'd have for regular tuples, but you get it automatically in your indexes because you stored the indexes in the table. And as far as I know, as, as of 2018, uh, unless, unless you know, somebody else does this and, I, and it, it just, it's in a paper and I missed it, or um, a commercial system does this. I, I can't think of any other system that actually does this. Uh, I think this is actually really clever, and I think this is one of the uh, the, you know, the the key contributions of, of, of this paper. So you can so you don't have to do that that the predicate locks, the precision locking in hyper. You don't have to do the scan set validation that you did in uh, in um, in Hecaton. If the node is consistent. Or if, it, if the version of the index you read is the same is the the same one when you go to validate, then you know no one could have inserted a new entry, and you're good. Now you have to be careful about things like well, you really only care about the the leaf nodes whether they change and the internal nodes can change, right? Because you're reorganizing. Right? There's some extra stuff you have to do to make this actually work nicely. Um, but again, you don't have to do that extra phantom avoidance stuff. And I thought that was really clever. Okay. So let's look at the results from the Cicada paper. So uh, Hyuntech, he is a postdoc here at CMU. He did his PhD with Dave Anderson. Uh, he is a, an amazing hacker. Uh, he basically took all the state-of-the-art uh, MCC protocols, except for Hyper, because uh, it's a column store, and he implemented in them in his system. And he ran experiments to see how well they perform when you scale up the number of threads. So for this first workload, it's going to be low contention. Right, so it's YCSB where you're, you're reading and writing a single tuple per transaction. Um, and so it's 90% reads and 5% writes. So the, you know, we can't have conflicts when it's read, read. There, there aren't read, read conflicts. So we don't have to do uh, a bunch of validation for these things. So what you see is that there is a cluster of protocols that actually do quite well. Uh, Cicada, um, FOTUS, which came out of HP Labs uh, by Hideaki Kimura. Um, and then the sort of the his optimized version of Silo, and then the original version of Silo, 
And then um, I think TikTok is in there well, which is the system that, uh, the, the paper that I worked on with uh, a student at MIT. Right? All of these protocols work pretty well when you start scaling the number of threads. No surprise, two-phase two locking uh, performs poorly because you're holding locks. Uh, the sum of transactions are holding, holding exclusive locks, and you can't have speculative reads of that. Um, I forget the details of why Irma and, uh, and Hecaton actually perform poorly here. Um, but this, can, this shows that under multi-versioning, uh, for, for, sorry, with, with the low contention uh, protocol, some of these systems are single version, but, but Cicada is multi versioned and it's performing just as good as the single version ones. The real difference, though, is when you go to high contention workloads. So for this, this is very extreme. So you're going to run the TPCC workload, the, all five TPCC transactions, but they're only going to have one warehouse. And so you'll learn more about the TPCC over the course of the semester, but the, a large portion of the workload is this thing called the new order transaction. But think of like placing a new order on Amazon. And so the reason why the number of warehouses is significant is because every new order transaction has to, has to update this, this counter inside the, the warehouse table. Right? So we only have one tuple in the, where, in the warehouse table. So everybody's trying to update this single one counter. And so what you see is that all the protocols now perform poorly. Uh, Irma, which is actually the, the, one of the worst ones before, is now doing actually the best up until uh, 24 threads. Uh, but in the case of Cicada, it actually performs the best, right? You still plateau here uh, at some point. Like if this thing beyond went, went to more threads, I, I think it would, it would stay flat, um, essentially because it ends up being uh, serial validation and, and only one transaction it can commit at a time. Um, but the overhead of doing that, getting that one transaction to commit uh, is much lower than the other guys. So any questions about Cicada? So again, I think the, the main contribution is the, uh, the index-only nodes. I think that the best effort inlining is interesting, um, but essentially ends up being the same thing as the delta storage model. Um, and the loosely synchronized clocks is, is an efficient way to, to do uh, timestamp management. Why does silo fall off so sharply? His question is, why does silo fall off so, so, so sharply? I, I, I don't remember. Yeah. Um, I think this version of Silo came from the Xing Yao that did the, the TikTok with me. So I think there's something in his implementation of Silo that doesn't match exactly what the original Silo did. Like I know it also wasn't using the mass tree, which is the, the, the index that Eddie Kohler built for Silo. Um, whereas the Silo Prime, the you know, this one here, uh, that's actually with the mastery, and there's some other optimizations they do as well. Yeah, but I, I, don't, I, I don't know why it actually falls off. Yes? So with like the index leaf nodes are also now objects that can be like in the read set and write set. Does that mean like two transactions that previously like just like access different objects, so they like wouldn't kind of, like, wouldn't kind of depend on the like Now like the, the two objects happen to be on the same leaf node, and the transactions might. Yeah, so, his, so his statement is, if now I'm storing uh, the leaf nodes as tuples, and if I have a uh, if I have two transactions that access, which should be clear, read or write, like, right. right, right. So they both write to the um, if they both write to the same tuple, or sorry, the same the same leaf node. Uh, so if they write, say, 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 most transactions say could be updating, uh, uh, creating a new version. Because the, the, the pointer is going to point to that master version list, I don't have to update that every time I create a new version. Right? It's, it's that indirection layer we saw last class. Um, but certainly, if like, two guys try to insert into the same leaf node, there'll be a conflict. But you would have that anyway with, as we'll see next class, would do index locking. right? So it's the same thing. Yeah, in the back. So, so Jada shows great performance across all these varieties of workloads. So What's the catch? What's being done with it now? Why isn't it Okay, so his, his question is, or statement, is that, I mean, in, in these charts here, Cicada does amazing, right? Uh, so why isn't everybody jumping, you know, why isn't everybody rewriting their system to actually use this? Um, so I would say that I don't know actually how it performs for analytical queries. And I think that would be a big drawback. And I feel like the hyper guys make certain design decisions for analytical queries that are be much better.
right? Um, so I think in the paper, the only look at TPCC and YCSB, those, those are, are OLTP workloads. Um, yeah, so I think, I think that's, that's the answer. But I, certainly I think uh, you know, storing indexes in the tables is, is a, a good idea we, you know, other, people, other people should consider. Okay, so uh, the protocols we showed here today and last class were all about maintaining serializable ordering of transactions. So they had different ways that how they would handle uh, uh, to check for phantoms. And again, the phantoms are always an issue when you have range scans. So we'll see this in, in the next lecture on Wednesday, what I'll call the more traditional ways to deal with phantoms by actually doing locks and latching in, inside of your inside of your indexes. Um, it is also my opinion now that I consider Hyper and Cicada to be state-of-the-art uh, in-memory MVCC protocols um, as, of, as of, you know, I guess February 2018. Um, they're, I mean, Hackathon is very good, but again, they're not focusing on that. Uh, MemSQL doesn't support serializable isolation, um, and they're more worried about uh, the distributed OLAP um, but in terms of the single box, in-memory, multi-version control, I think these two systems are the best. Um, and I regret that our system doesn't do these things, right? We can take, take that offline. Okay. <laughs> All right, so project two. So uh, you guys are going to implement a skip list in Peloton. Um, again, skip list is a latch-free data structure that... Uh, the story is actually skip lists are from the 1990s. Um, they were sort of been around for a while, but they really only became in vogue when people took uh, were very in, became interested in lock free or latch free data structures and algorithms. Um, the story is actually from uh, the Hackathon guys when they first started building Hackathon. They were super into to skip lists, and they had all of these presentations internally at Microsoft about how great skip lists were, right? And the MemSQL guy was there at the time working on the SQL Server team, not on Hackathon, just the general team. He saw all these talks about how great the skip lists were. So then he left about halfway through the, uh, the, the Hackathon project, went to Facebook for a while, then he went off and, and formed uh, the MemSQL company and started building their system. And he saw all those, those talks from Microsoft about how great the skip lists were. Uh, and so that's why MemSQL is big on skip lists today. And the problem is he didn't see this, the second half of the talks from the Hackathon guys that says skip lists are actually bad. And then they came out with the, B, came out with the BW tree and said that was better. Um, there's better things in the BW tree. But uh, the reason why you got, we're having you guys implement skip lists is because it's, it covers, again, all the important things that we care about in, in latch-free data structures. Um, and it's something, and you know, garbage collection is something you guys can build in, in a month. Okay? So the... Spec is on the website. Um, we're providing you guys with headers um, for the index API that you have to implement. So your index needs to be a drop-in replacement for the BW tree. We already have a bunch of tests for the, uh, for the BW tree. And essentially, there's an index factory. If you, you change the flag and say, I want a, a skip list instead of a BW tree, and your thing should just work exactly the same. But we'll provide some additional tests for you that already sort of set things up for you. So, there's a bunch of design decisions that you guys are going to have to deal with as you build this thing. Uh, and you can ask me, we discuss, you know, what are the trade-offs of these various things, but there's no one right answer, right? How you want to organize your, your, your garbage collector, how you want to organize uh, your towers and your skip list, that's entirely up to you guys. Now, I'll say also, too, I know, I'm sure if you go look on GitHub, there's students that took the class in previous years, and you can go find their skip list implementations. I have them all, too. And we can, we can check, you know, use the MOS thing on Autolab to check to see whether you're exactly the same. So please don't look at other people. You should try to think this through yourself because um, I, I think you, you'll get more out of this. I've also been told at, uh, I don't want to say where, but at some database companies, the questions of skip lists and lock-free uh, garbage collection and things like that come up often. So basically this class essentially is the, is the interview questions at some companies, right? But it's not by design. All right, so again, we're going to provide you C++ tests, uh, and then you also have the VW tree to compare against. And just like in the first project, you guys are going to want to uh, extend the tests we provide you and do your additional testing. So I think we'll do, um, I think we do provide you multi-threading tests, but we're not going to check all the different corner cases you have to deal with um, in, in, your, in your index. Okay? Um, 
We're going to want you guys also write documentation in the code, explain what all the different parts you're doing, because Prashant, Prashant and I will look through and see whether your assumptions that you make or how you design certain things are actually valid and correct. Um, so you should make sure that you, you, you do write as much documentation and comments as possible. I think it's, it's good practice to always do this. So um, unlike in the first project, we're actually going to try to do speed tests on this project uh, to check to see how fast you are. So uh, the problem with Autolab, I think it only provides a single thread, so we may have to work something out with them or do additional testing on the side. But we'll provide bonus points for the top three groups that have the highest or the, the best performance. So there'll be that there's a, so the functionality test we'll grade you on, and then there'll be additional speed tests where you know we'll like insert a billion things and then delete a billion things and see how fast you are. And then we'll use the leaderboard on Autolab to figure out who, who actually is the best. Okay? And then as always, you want to use Valgrind or the sanitized flag in GCC to make sure that you don't leak any memory. And then use Clang format to make sure that you're, you're following our uh, formatting guidelines. So I think everyone should be in a group. I think there's one student uh, who's not here today who's looking for a group. Um, but I think everyone's filled out in the spreadsheet, right? I think I saw 12 groups. We have 38 students. OK, so if you're not in a group, send me an email, and we'll deal with it. So um, the that is way wrong, March 2nd. All right, I think it's March 12th. All right, whatever the Monday is during spring break, that's when it's actually due. So maybe ignore that. Uh, 2017, come on, that's retarded. <laughs> All right. Uh, you know what it is? Because, yeah, you don't care. I Because I split the MVCC slides from last class and this class. Um, yeah, this is way off. Shit. Uh, I'll fix this. Okay. It's due March 12th. Okay. All right, so next class, again, uh, this is it for concurrency troll, but this is going to come out throughout the semester. Uh, when we start talking about analytical queries, because you want to think in the back of your mind, how would I actually do this when I know those transactions could be updating uh, the database at the same time? So we're going to look at, again, what I'll call traditional methods to do index locking and latching. And then we'll see how to do uh, latch-free data structures where you don't have to do this. Um, but then we'll say why it's bad, and we'll go back to adding locks in a more efficient way on, on the third indexing lecture. OK? Any questions? Mmm, I need something refreshing when I get finished manifesting To cold a whole bowl like Smith & Wesson One court and my thoughts hip-hop related Write a rhyme and my pen's intoxicated Lyrics are quicker with a sip of more liquor Since I'm a city slicker, brain waves are quicker Rhymes I create, rotate, add a weight Too quick to duplicate, fill a breeze, have a skate Mics at Fahrenheit when I hold it real tight When I'm in flight, then we ignite Blood starts to boil, I heat up the party for you let my girl run me and my mic down with oil Records still turn with third degree burns for one man I heat up your brain, give it a suntan So just cool, let the temperature rise To cool it off with St. Ives 